I can make him fly also. Charlotte Soccer Show, John Hayes, Danny Brams. We're back with another episode here on our Charlotte Soccer Show YouTube page. It is Thursday afternoon as of this recording, Danny. Only a few days away from what is looking to be, Danny, one of the most beautiful spring days of the season. The supporters, they have really battled against some cold weather, some nasty win in the first two home mm -hmm. matches of the season. And I got to tell you, Danny, I cannot wait to get to hop fly for our pre-match tailgate for our pre-game show because the vibe on Saturday looks to be immaculate. Yeah, they say, what do they say in this match, in this game? They say you put in the work and you get your reward. And we have put in the work of suffering through two very cold Saturdays in the Queen City uh, for our two previous home matches, and it's looking beautiful. Uh, for Saturday at 7.30, we're taking on FC Cincinnati. We have another very special guest. This is a, an indication of how big this match is. This is like the third preview of this match that I have done this week. And we're honored to welcome another very special guest from Apple MLS Season Pass. And as, as we like to do on this show, I always go digging. When we got when they, they tell us who's going to come be our guest, I say, all right, I get to work and I go digging back. I try to go as far back as I can with these folks. And this one's a little different. This is a, the, the Charlotte Soccer Show Vault has a new entry uh, that hopefully will make you smile. Hopefully you can tell what's going on here. I had to edit a little bit out, but we'll, we'll see. Let me tell you about Tony Husband. He's talented, award-winning. He's got fans all over the world. And he's a Manchester United supporter too. I think you've realised it's probably not me. In fact, it's the original Tony Husband, one of the best-known cartoonists in the industry. He suggested we try a brief job swap. I had a go at his business. Tony's challenge was to describe that goal. Oh, and Ian Turner now with the goal kick straight up the field. It's a high one. Lou McCory goes, oh, Lou McCory's missed it. It's gone, it drops to Jim McCallyog, who hoofs it forward. And Bobby Stokes, he's scored. I cannot believe this. Well, there we go, Tony, our first cartoon. I'm quite pleased with it. I'm not sure about the full-time score, though. But anyway, do you want the last word? Tony Husband, BBC South Today, Hyde. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please welcome Tony Husband to the show. How are you doing, Tony? Oh, great. Thank you. And that was an excellent deep dive, I have to say. <laughs> I was thinking back, I wonder what you might have been able to find. And um, that's a really good one. And uh, the, the, the late, great Tony Husband, um, who uh, uh, it just was, it was fantastic. And um, do you know, when, I, um, when my wife and I uh, were moving over to the US, um, we had to get these visas um, to, to be able to come in and for me to be able to, to actually have a work permit. And... Um, uh, an old friend of mine got in touch with Tony and said, you know, Tony's leaving England. He's going to the States to, to move and start a new job. And uh, our visas were called Aliens of Extraordinary Ability. Um, and uh, he got Tony to do me uh, my own cartoon. And it was a picture of me dressed as Superman and my Amazing. wife dressed in other, some other kind of superhero outfit. And uh, we were at a, a U.S. immigration desk and they, and they said, Tony and Helena, welcome you are aliens of extraordinary ability and um that's a, a framed tony husband cartoon that is very very uh precious to me and uh he's a super guy but great digging great yeah, digging there danny fantastic that's what i do and you are an alien you're now a, you know a, a regular of extraordinary ability as you've been calling <laughs> yeah. nashville games for years and you now you joined apple mls season plus as that got going and uh season pass i should say and uh, you work for BBC Match of the Day. You're, you're all, you know, you called. One of the things that we want to talk to you maybe a little bit about is you have had a passion for American sports, you know, your whole life as far as calling NFL and Major League Baseball for the BBC. Would love to know a little bit about that flip. But we're here mostly to talk about Charlotte at Cincinnati. And I can see John getting itchy already. So uh, this is the second time you've called us. Our friend Ross Smith, who we made friends with him last week. Uh, you, he's your partner in the booth. And we uh, can't wait to – we won last week, so really glad to have you guys back. Johnny, what do you think about this matchup? I, I, I'm absolutely pumped about this matchup. And one thing I want to do before we start talking about the match on Saturday is relive what we saw th this past Saturday. Just Rossi. Just been off the mark tonight. The header down into the path of Westwood to hit it. A brilliant goal for Charlotte.
Here's a chance for Andrew Mang, and he absolutely roots it. Charlotte go from MLS Cup winners to Shield winners when they host Cincinnati next weekend. That game, Saturday 7.30 on MLS season pass, but for now, the crown conquer the crew. Absolutely a brilliant work, Tony. Just a pleasure to hear you call uh, both of those goals and 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 give the final uh, rundown at the end of that match there. A great line that was. And it's so nice to have both you and, and Ross on the call on back-to-back weeks, right? Because it gives you an opportunity to really dig into the crown. So that's where I want to start. Uh, what impressed you about the club on Saturday night against Columbus? And, and what do you expect um, them to bring from that match into the match against Cincinnati on Saturday? Well, I think my first impression coming back was uh, I'd only been to Charlotte once before last year and uh, it, during the Christian Latanzio reign. And, and I would say Christian, fascinating guy to sit down and talk to. Uh, and I uh, was very, very good with his time. Um, but I just felt coming back to Charlotte this year for the first time, really, since the club's been in MLS, just been a little bit of a feeling of um, a little bit more calmness uh, around the club, uh, a little bit more stability. Uh, a little bit more of a, a focused direction and a solid path. Um, and just a very big impact that Dean Smith has made in a very short time. He's somebody, you know, he arrived in December in terms of being appointed. But everybody says about his directional path is just very clear. Uh, everybody's clear in, their, in what they need to do, what the target is, where the club wants to go. And also the fact that he's managed to work with coaches who in many ways he's inherited or have been have come to the club that he hasn't worked with. He's not just brought half a dozen guys from England over with him because he's always worked with them. Uh, and the way he's been very collegiate with work on the training ground, he tells them what he wants and he's letting them get on and do it. So I just got a feeling of togetherness at the club that maybe I hadn't seen in the first couple of years. And that was reflected in, in the performance on Saturday night in many ways, because I think what they did was they didn't, they didn't kind of go into a panic mode. Oh, we're playing against 10 men. So, you know, we've now got to change everything and we've just got to start trying to score goals. They didn't panic. They left it late and eventually they wore them down enough and a couple of great strikes get you the win. Yeah, you saw the, gra- the graphic I popped up there, Tony, because this is how we say it down here. Dino's at the wheel. That <laughs> it basically sums up everything you just said. And I love that you use the word togetherness because that's a word that has come out of Dino's mouth a lot. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I mean, uh, he joked with us last week. Obviously, he shares such a great famous coaching name in, in uh, North Carolina. So uh, he was laughing about how he, you know, he's already found a highway named after him and things like that, you know, <laughs> but uh, it gives you an idea. He's settled into the area and, and, you know, he has the, the place in Myrtle beach. Um, he's got a little bit of background. His sons have been in the state as well. So, you know, he's not just parachuted in, you know, just to the next job with Charlotte. I think this is something he's really come to do as a, a life experience, a coaching experience. And it's in an area that he actually does have an interest in and cares about. And I think you can see that reflected in the way about in which he's going about the job. And, and you know, this is a good moment. You know, there's, everything is in such a good place in Charlotte. I mean, I, I'm so pleased to be coming back and I hope I'll be coming back many more times because uh, I, I love the match day atmosphere. I think that the fan base is is fantastic for such a young club and you know the stadium is big but that almost seems to just challenge the people in the area to to come and try and fill it as much as possible and so you know it's a tremendous tremendous project that's going on there and you just feel now though it's it's kind of got a little bit of um foundation underneath it and fingers crossed the only way is kind of to move forward now you use the phrase parachuting in, and I think sometimes that has a negative connotation. And I promise uh, what I'm about to say is is the opposite of that, right? Because you're in a position, Tony, where you get to parachute in across all of MLS in your role as a play-by-play commentator for MLS season pass on, on Apple, right? So I love to talk to people like you about Charlotte FC and how this club compares to the rest of the league. You offer such a great perspective on that uh, from the fan base to the actual roster, to the manager. So far, what you've seen this season in in MLS, where does Charlotte fit into the picture? I think they fit in in as far as um, they look to me uh, like a reflection of their coach. And I think any team that uh, does that is is going the right way. I think it comes from the top. It always does. If, If your head coach has got a clear identity about himself, about what he wants to achieve, if he's doing his job well, you see it reflected in the team. And I think that's what you see reflected in the team right now um, with this Charlotte group. I see organization. Uh, I see a bit of pragmatism in there that is required to get results. I see a team that 
is likely to be very difficult to to get results in Charlotte. And I think that is the first uh, point that you want with with any team. You want to win home games and certainly not lose them. And Charlotte now actually going back even to the end of last season in a really good place when it comes to playing uh, at home. So th those are the positive things that, that I would take out of having seen Charlotte so far. I still think, you know, there is depth there that could be added. Uh, I think, you know, throw in a few injuries to, to most clubs and, you know, you're going to see a drop off in certain areas of the field. I think Charlotte are no exception there. Uh, it's going to be really interesting to see how well Abada and how quickly he can settle in and, and just add a little bit more quality onto the field. Um, there's a workmanlike quality, I think, to Charlotte, which is, is going to do well for them in MLS, but it's obviously going to be one that needs to evolve and add a little bit more quality on the top as time goes on. But I think, you know, I'm saying things that Dean Smith is, he's five steps ahead of me on. Uh, and we know, you know, that he will have a plan for all this and he will have a very, very clear idea about what he wants from this team. And I think he's set them up right now to say, this is, this is what we're going to do. And then we're going to evolve from there. So here's here's what I want to know, sort of building on what you saw in the building last weekend. The the game was very much yes, we were very joyous and euphoric, even you know getting the two two nil win against the champions. But there was a point, you know, 80th minute before Westwood's goal there, where it was it was nervy time. It was it was squeaky bum time, you know, as they say. Like because if we if we somehow were to lose to ten men at home then all of a sudden it's almost like it's it was the difference between a cliff and a rocket ship is kind of the way I described it. And so, you know, I love the way that you call that out. You kind of seem to sense that by on your call of the Ashley Westwood goal, which was just let the moment soak in. You you know, when you when Westwood scored, you just really let the crowd milk that moment on the broadcast, which I thought was a very veteran announcer move by you. And what do you think, though, from having watched this game? Can that do, are we more likely to win against Cincinnati, or, or do we take momentum with us from the the manner in which we were able to beat Columbus? Well, th yeah, thank you on the goal call. I think it says a lot about Charlotte that you know that the atmosphere is so passionate, the the stadium is reverberates, um, and I think sometimes you know commentators can be guilty of trying to find too many words in a moment. But there wasn't really anything else to say other than you know it's a great goal or whatever I said you know and then just leave it and let the crowd and let the atmosphere take over. Um, and a, a little secret on Patrick Adjibang's goal, by the way, as well. Spoke to him on the Friday, and um, he actually referenced uh, how he would put the hand up to his ear for the, for if he scored. And and I said, oh, you know, what what do you mean by that? And he just kind of said, it's a, just it's just telling everyone, you know, like I'm here. And he'd done it obviously in in Next Pro, um, and you know, he, he, the, the, yeah, call Pat. So. I had a I had a tee up on that, and I knew something like that would come. Um, and I had two or three thoughts about maybe what I would say. I don't like to kind of write things down specifically. Like I will say this if they score, but I had it in my mind. Well, if he does score and he does go up to the corner and he and he does do that, um, then you know perhaps I have something in you know think of something to say at the, in the moment about about the call. So so you know that's just an insight into kind of some of the prep work we do with our job, but. Um, but no, it was. Uh, I think it was. A, it's momentum now going into this game, without a doubt. I wouldn't have been overly, you know, it, on the face of it. If you hadn't got the two late goals, you could have come away saying, "Look, that's disappointing playing ten men." But what I would say is, Columbus for me are the best team in MLS, without a doubt. Uh, and I include Miami in that. Um, okay, you could you could put Miami's kind of superstars all on the field on one day, and they could play at their absolute best. Maybe they win that game on on a given day. But I think overall, Columbus are the best team in the league. And you saw the quality and the confidence they're playing with that they didn't necessarily get too distracted by the fact that not only did they have a man sent off, but they also lost two starters to injury within the first 30 minutes or so of the game. So an awful lot of things happened to throw them off their stride. And it's a measure of how good they are that they actually were very much in the game. Uh, so, you know, if it had finished nil-nil, I wouldn't have said that would be a reason to be kind of getting all, oh, this is not good enough, you know. I think that okay. there would have been a context to it. So Thank you. Right. putting my heart at ease there, but it was, I was, I was, I was nervous, man. And that, that, that was the euphoria I felt was like winning felt like joy and relief at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one thing, obviously you've got to come up with a penalty taker. 
um, you know, somebody who can can convert these penalties because you want to keep missing penalties. Don't make me all. play it. Don't make me play it, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, we, it's it's almost like you watched our our Sunday show at Hotfly this past Sunday when we did our match recap. There was a moment in the show uh, that Danny Brams he had a full beer. We were sitting on the couch at Hotfly, and he looks straight into the camera and he says, "Dean, I want to know what you're going to do next. I don't care who takes the PK. You got to fix somebody and put him on the spot. It feels like." Patrick Ajemong and Ashley Westwood are probably uh, in the running for the next PK if we if we see one on on Saturday. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess so. Um, I, and I mean, I guess in time, maybe a Bardo comes into that. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, it, it, you want to have somebody who has got a bit of confidence from, from 12 yards out. And uh, obviously, that wasn't a great penalty. I mean, maybe a bit of justice done. It's so funny, isn't it, how this game works sometimes. I mean, you know, you arguably on the rough end of some decisions in Nashville, um, certainly a penalty decision. And um, and then you get get one of the softer penalties that I've seen uh, last weekend, yes. and 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 then you miss it. You know, so yeah. it, it's amazing how these things do. You, you know, they do to quote the old cliche. Uh, and us English, we love our cliches when it comes to soccer. Um, you know, things do have an amazing way of balancing themselves out. Yeah, yeah. They, cer they certainly do. And and while while we have you here, right? And I think the the best part about talking to a play-by-play announcer and a color analyst, uh, your partner, Ross Smith, is that when you're preparing for these games, you're really doing a deep dive on both teams. And while we're so close to the sun here in Charlotte, thinking about this squad, what can you, what can you tell us about Cincinnati? You, you say Columbus is by far and away the best team in MLS. Where does Cincinnati fall in on your power rankings? Obviously the, the reigning supporters shield champions, but they, they lose a ton of players uh, heading into this season, but they've managed to to get results and, and are unbeaten through the season so far. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you certainly, you know, these, these have been hard games to have at home for Charlotte. I mean, you go from, you know, the MLS Cup winners to Supporters Shield winners. And, you know, this week's it's Cincinnati arriving. I don't take too much notice of standings at this point. But, you know, if you, if you wanted to, they are top of the East right now. Um, they are undefeated. Right. Uh, goals have not been coming as, as frequently for them to start this season as perhaps they have in the past but then you know when you sell Brandon Vasquez it, you don't, can't just replace him with a click of the fingers um, but I still see a team that's thriving off the confidence of last year again a team that Pat Noonan has you know really turned around fast and I suppose if you're looking at Dean Smith and you know, an example of what you can do with the right coaching and the right players and the right organization you can turn things quite quickly in MLS so that would be the incentive I would say with with, with Dean Smith and Charlotte you know you could turn things around quite quickly and go from the lower reaches of the league quite high, um, you know, without without having to wait too many years. So, and, and Pat Noonan's done a wonderful job there. Uh, but he's also, you know, they, they've got one of the best players in the league without a shadow of a doubt in Acosta. Um, so having silenced Cucho last week, you've now got to try and do Lucho this week. So <laughs> it, it, it's going to be, um, it, it's going to be interesting to see how you, how you tackle that Cincinnati group. They'll have Miles Robinson back, I suspect, uh, after international duty. Um, they're getting results away from home as well. Uh, sometimes, you know, everyone's talked about the CONCACAF Champions Cup being negative for, for teams early in the season because they're playing a lot of games. That's true, but it also means they're getting a lot of reps and players will always tell you they'd rather play than be practicing all the time. So um, I think that now that they're out of that competition and they're focusing on the league, those early season games um, against the likes of Monterey actually now become a benefit to them because they're, they're in gear, they're moving forward. And, you know, there'll be a difficult proposition. So I, I suspect uh, this is going to be another quite, you know, quite tricky game and probably not decided by too many goals. Now, I, I don't know. There's something something hurtful about being wounded by your former player, though. They're your own former player knocks you out of a big cup competition. That's got to be an emotional scar for sure. Now, you said you don't write down your calls, Tony, in advance, but that Cucho Lucho connection, I'm, sens I'm sensing something there that I'm going to be listening for in the pregame on Saturday for sure because there's, there's, there's definitely a connection. I want to talk a little bit about uh, your life and, and your calling, your commentator philosophy. And, and like I mentioned earlier in the show, you called NFL games and, and base Major League Baseball games for BBC Radio back in your, your home country. Tell us a little bit about your history and, and what got you interested in American sports and eventually coming to America to, to broadcast an international sport. Yeah, I mean, it's a story, you know, uh, that um, uh, it really starts with the growing up in a certain period of time in, in, in the 1980s in, in England, which every time I say that now, it feels like it's longer and longer ago. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't it feel is. like that long ago to me to be talking about the Spoiler 1980s. alert, it is, Tony. Yeah, yeah. sadly. Sadly, it is. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, it, 
in the 1980s, um, English soccer, you know, our national game and our, our biggest game, you know, was mired in a, a pretty bleak period. You know, the, the, the stadiums were dilapidated. They were falling down. The game was barely shown on television. You know, I, I think people over here still sometimes can't comprehend it. If I was to tell you that, you know, during an entire English Division One season, with what would now be called Premier League, you know, there were, there were a couple of years where there were no games on, live on television at all. It was only highlights. Um, uh, and then gradually moved to maybe a few more games were on, the odd, the odd game. But, you know, there was nothing like what we're used to in the 21st century in terms of exposure. Uh, and as I mentioned, the stadiums were dilapidated. There was violence. The game was blighted by hooliganism. And it was blighted also by um, some tragic moments, uh, a fire in Bradford, um, the Heysel Stadium disaster when Liverpool played uh, in the European Cup final. So you're growing up against the backdrop of that where you love the sport. It's still our national game. You follow the game. But, you know, it, it's, it's having a tough time. And at that time, um, a new UK television channel came on the air called Channel 4. Yeah, only our fourth channel, by the way. Fourth, <laughs> fourth channel. Um, you don't and, want to rush into anything with all of no, these channels. Exactly. Yeah. We only had three <laughs> channels, can you believe, on UK television at that time. And then a fourth channel started. And they came on TV uh, or came on the air. And they started to show some other sports from around the world that, and in the course of pre-internet world, you know, if you're watching a, a game that's a week old, tape delayed, you didn't know what had happened, you know, when the Chicago Bears had played the San Francisco 49ers or whatever. But it was, it was thanks to my dad, really, because he started out of curiosity watching NFL highlights on a Sunday night. And as I said, they were tape delayed and they were a week old. But it didn't matter. We didn't know the scores. Right. And I, I just started watching it with him. And then we got to the end of the season and I said, oh, I really, I'm quite enjoying this. Because there was a razzmatazz about it. There was a slickness about the television production and presentation that we didn't have in the UK at the time. You saw the commentators in the booth. You know, so we're talking about John Madden, Pat Summerall, mm -hmm. young Al Michaels, Frank Gifford, um, you know, uh, Dick Enberg. Who I absolute into. legends. Yeah, Merlin Olsen. Maybe, Mer Olsen. maybe a little Merlin Olsen. <laughs> Merlin Olsen as yeah. well. Merlin Olsen was on the call. First Super Bowl I was ever allowed to watch live um, until the early hours of the morning was called by Dick Enberg and Merlin Olsen. And it was the 49ers against the Bengals. And it was Montana to John Taylor oh, yeah. with 34 seconds left or whatever yeah. it was. You know, these are things that, uh, you know, right. I couldn't tell you what I was doing last week apart from the Charlotte game. But these things are just, they're stuck in my brain. You know, you remember these, these oh, yeah. big moments. So I just really got into it. You know, I loved it. And then from that kind of, they started to show a little bit of baseball as well. So I thought, oh, I'll get into that as well. Um, but NFL football, football, you know, it really became a huge passion growing up alongside the, you know, the traditional sports that I played in, in England, like our football and, and cricket and things like that. So um, that's the background of how I kind of got so interested in it. It's fascinating, too, because sometimes I, I, I hear you saying that and some Americans and our, and our love for the beautiful game, soccer, football, whatever you want to call it, is the total reverse of that. Mm -hmm. Right. Where and you're living it now here in the United States where you get up on early on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning and you get to kind of tap into what the soccer culture has become in the UK, what the Premier League has been, what that Division One ended up turning into now 40, 40 years later, which is the best league in the world. Uh, so there's so many people. The game is growing here in in the United States. There's there's no doubt about that because of the the, the broadcast availability of now uh, English soccer in the United States. So for me, what's your perspective on on MLS, right? And and we'll, we'll get you out of here in just a few minutes. We really appreciate your time today, and look forward to getting you back here in Charlotte this weekend. But as a whole, right, you've you've been around soccer your entire life, and, and MLS has had some moments, and they've they've had some not so good moments right and it feels like at this time the league is is was trending and the league is starting to, to garner some respect uh, obviously you're partnered with the league with apple mls season pass which has been a massive massive opportunity for not just american fans but fans globally to see this league can you kind of sense the groundswell that is mls growing into a global product Absolutely, I do. And I say that, you know, in the full realization that you know, this is an incredibly uh, competitive market. And, and, you know, 
I'm not for one minute going to tell you that we, you know, we're right on the precipice of challenging the top European leagues for, you know, the, you know, being the best out there. You know, the European leagues have been established in most cases for, you know, over a century. Um, you talked about the Premier League there. You know, when I was back in England, the Premier League, I used to call, you know, it became a Hollywood league. It was Hollywood because you turned up at the game and if you were doing uh, media jobs like mine, you, would, you were actually being requested on the match day. You're doing this, oh, because this is needed for NBC. This is needed for B in sports. This is needed, you know, um, for Al Jazeera or whatever, you know, whatever the channels around the world might have been showing it. Um, and then when you went to a football league game, the difference was huge between, say, Premier League and Championship. Um, the Premier League has become, you know, totally global um, and for the most part has had the best players or not, not always, but, you know, a lot of the best players anyway, and certainly the most revenue. Um, where MLS is right now is in a fascinating place because it's moved on light years from 1996, quite clearly. Uh, you look at the venues and you look at the fan bases uh, and they've grown exponentially. The, the stadiums now are outstanding. They're as good as anything around the new soccer venues around the world. Um, the investment in the training facilities. I'm absolutely blown away when I go to some of these training facilities now. Um, what Kansas City have got, incredible. You know, um, you just, Nashville uh, uh, got a re relatively new training facility now. Outstanding. And I think players around the world are being drawn now in greater numbers and interest into MLS. And at all ages, not just near the end of their careers, but when they're in peak years still, because they're seeing the lifestyle, they're seeing the opportunity to play in this league with the fan bases, the stadiums, the facilities, so many different things. And it's a journey. You know, I mean, in terms of the Apple deal, this is year two of 10. So it's a, it's a journey, it's a progression. And I think it's a marathon, not a sprint. So the evolution is going to continue. The television deal is absolutely something that everybody else in the world, whatever sports league they're in, whatever country they're in, they're looking at and saying, this is really interesting. The idea of everything in one place, global streaming, very, very interesting. And I also think just if we think about even just two years ago, I think if I came on a, a show like this and we talked about the broadcasting of Major League Soccer, we would almost certainly be talking straight away about the frustrations of blackouts and things like that. I think it's incredible how quickly we don't even think about you know, the word blackout has gone from our vocabulary now when we talk about mm -hmm. MLS. So uh, and the other sports, you know, as you look at regional sports networks and, and the challenges they're facing, you know, they're still in those worlds. So, um, you know, this this journey is a long one, um, but it is absolutely like you said, John, you know, it is moving in a very good direction. The trend clearly helps when you can bring the likes of, of Messi to the league um, and have the best player in the planet, the most recognizable player in the planet playing in this league. So no bad, no bad thing at all. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. We're seeing it here in Charlotte with Leia Labada. We, we've talked to people at the club uh, who said he only wanted to come to Charlotte. Once, once he heard what Charlotte was all about, once we made the pitch, he's like, I don't want to go to LA. I don't want to go to New York. I want to go to Charlotte. He's coming to begin his MLS adventure. We hope to see a cameo in the building. Uh, but I think he's, he's emblematic of exactly what you're saying. Yeah, that's right. And I think for every Messi, it's important that there, there's an Abada coming as well. And, you know, and an Almada in uh, Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, Stay, yeah. You know, they, they, they also are very, very important. And I think, you know, some of the roster adjustments that will be made uh, as the year goes on will also encourage even more of those uh, very, very good younger players uh, to come to this league. And, and you'll, see, you, you'll see these rosters get stronger and stronger. I mean, uh, there's a reason for some of the parity. There's a reason for the salary caps down the years. I think if you hadn't had those 15, 20 years ago, the league, you know, is, is in a dangerous place. Right now, though, you can see with the way the foundations are so strong now for MLS that that's why things can loosen off a bit. And we can we'll start to see those rosters get even stronger team by team, club by club. And ultimately, that is what's going to make the league bigger and help it grow and help it start to challenge some of those really big established leagues in Europe because if you it's all about players it all comes down to play if you've got quality on the field people will watch it uh, there's no doubt about that and I think uh, uh, many fans are going to be watching Saturday night on MLS season pass it's Charlotte FC versus FC Cincinnati we call this one Tony the Queen City Derby 
Yeah. And, and, you know, so it's, it's, it's a, it's a Derby. It's, I'm not sure if anybody else in the country knows that both these cities are called <laughs> the queen city, uh, but they certainly are. And we've, Danny and I will, we'll take any reason to, to create a Derby and a rivalry mm-hmm. here in the first three years of, of existence um, here in MLS. So cheers to you. Thank you so much for, for joining Charlotte soccer show today. It was a pleasure to hear you on the call on Saturday. And one thing we always hope for is that we'll be live on, on Sunday at five o'clock at hop fly reviewing the match and I'm just crossing my fingers that we're, we're listening to some more Tony husband calls of Charlotte FC goals. Um, so, so again, I appreciate your time today. It's great to meet you. And thanks for joining Charlotte soccer show. Great to join you both. And uh, good luck in the queen city Derby. Thanks much for the crown, baby.